Hi, welcome. In today's tutorial, I'm going to take you through the introductory part of hypothesis test. So these are the subtopics we'll be looking at in this particular tutorial. So without wasting much time, let's start. So first, we want to look at the meaning of the word hypothesis. And when we say hypothesis, hypothesis is a statement about a population. So when you make a statement, or a claim about an entire population, then it is an hypothesis. And then when we talk about hypothesis test, hypothesis test is a process that uses sample statistic to test a claim about the value of a population parameter. For instance, IC Cup company claims that the average sugar content in its IC Cup is not more than two milligrams. Now, the fact is, a scientist will never believe something unless there is a proof. So consider yourself as a scientist. Then you take a sample of 10 IC cups on campus. Then you decide to measure the sugar content in each of the 10 IC cups you've taken. Then you find the average. To check if it is true that it is actually no more than 2 milligrams, we allow some level of error and then check if there's any significant difference between your average and the average in their claim so that is what we are interested in in this particular topic so the first thing we are going to look at is how to state the null and the alternate hypothesis now to state the null and the alternate hypothesis we are going to translate a claim made about a population parameter from a verbal statement to a mathematical statement to be able to do this properly there are some signs i want you to know so let's take the first one, which is the equal to sign. Now, the equal to sign is also referred to as same as. Or when you see the word not different from or not different, okay, not different from K. Or when you see the word similar to, so it means that they are equal. So if I say A is similar to B, it means that what they are equal or approximately equal. Now, look at this sign also. It is called less than or equal to sign. And you can also refer to it as at most. So when you see the word at most five, it means that it is less than or equal to five. Not more than, meaning that that particular value is the maximum. So not more than five. It means that five is the maximum. So it also means at most five, okay? Or when you see the word is A or less, so it's five or less. Five or less is the same as saying not more than five. It's also the same as saying at most five. Okay, and it's also the same as saying less than or equal to five. And we also have the sign greater than or equal to. So the other words are at least. Okay, so when I say at least six, meaning the minimum should be six. When I say greater than or equal to six, it also means the minimum should be six, six or more. Okay. Or when I say not less than six, meaning that six should be the minimum. Or when I say is K or more. So when I say it is six or more, meaning six is the minimum. So from six upwards. So greater than or equal to these are the names you can use for it. And then we have the sign also not equal to. Okay. And its synonyms are not same as different from and also not similar to. And then look at this, this is a greater than sign, okay? And then the other words are more than, higher than, exceeding, above, increase. When you see those words, you should know it's referring to the greater than sign, okay? And then less than sign also, you can see words like fewer than, smaller than, below, okay? When you see these verbal statements too, they are referring to the symbol less than, okay? Now, look at these three, the equal to sign, the less than or equal to sign, and then the greater than or equal to sign. The three of them are referred to as statements of equality, okay? They are statements of what? Equality. And anytime you hear a statement of equality, we usually assign them to the null hypothesis, okay? So we say, the null hypothesis is a statistical hypothesis that contains a statement of equality. So the symbol used for the null hypothesis is H0. Okay. You read this as 
h naught or h sub zero okay so we assign the equality statements to the null hypothesis okay and then these three statements they're not equal to sign the greater than and the less than they are referred to as statements of inequality and we always assign them to the alternate hypothesis okay so we say alternate hypothesis is a statistical hypothesis that contains statements of inequality okay inequality so the symbol used for the alternate hypothesis is h sub one or you can use h sub a okay alternate hypothesis h sub one or h sub a you can use either okay correct before i go further there's something important i also want you to know and that is some words and opposite now the equal to sign has its opposite as the not equal to sign so it means that the not equal to sign its opposite is also equal to sign okay and also the less than or equal to sign its opposite is greater than so if i say the ages of all bsc statistics students is greater than 18 years what is the opposite it means that if they are not greater than 18 years then they should be less than or equal to 18. so the opposite of less than or equal to should be greater than which means that the opposite of greater than is also less than or equal to and then the greater than or equal to sign its opposite is the less than sign so if i say the average age of all bsc mathematics students is less than 25 years then what will be its opposite it means that if it is not less than 25 then it will be greater than or equal to 25. so remember these three are known as statement of equality because they contain the equal to signs okay whereas these three are known as what statement of inequalities so let's take some examples on how to state the null and alternate hypothesis for each of the claim below state the null and alternative hypothesis one says a student claims that the mean cost of a textbook is at least 125 dollars now to state the null and alternate hypothesis this is what you do first you write h naught okay and then bring a column and then you write the h sub a okay and then bring a column remember that i told you that you can also write it h sub one so it's not compulsory to write it h sub a okay that's the alternate hypothesis now after doing that then you go back to the statement it says a student claims that the mean cost of textbook is at least 125 dollars now when you see the word at least what does it mean at least means greater than or equal to isn't it which is a statement of equality and remember i told you earlier that whenever you see a statement of equality you assign it to the word to the null hypothesis so if that is the case how do we write this mathematically now look at this the mean and this is making a statement about an entire population so what is the symbol for population mean we usually use mu the one that looks like you okay and then this one says at least that is greater than or equal to sign which we are going to assign to the words to the null hypothesis i told you that all statements of equality should be assigned to the null hypothesis and all statements of inequality should be assigned to the words the alternate hypothesis so since this is a statement of equality then we assign it to the null hypothesis so we are going to have mu is greater than or equal to 125 dollars so you've been able to successfully what convert this verbal statement to a mathematical statement so after doing this then to write the alternate hypothesis just write the opposite of this now remember i told you that the opposite of greater than or equal to sign should be what less than sign so just write mu is less than 125 dollars 
then you are done stating the null and alternate hypothesis mathematically. Now, which of them is a claim? You realize that the null hypothesis happens to be the claim in this question one, okay? So the null hypothesis is the claim. Sometimes you see some questions, the alternate rather will be the claim. Let's go to question two and see. For example, two, a company claims that the mean lifetime of its AA batteries is more than 16 hours. So to write the null and the alternate hypothesis, first you write the H naught, which is the null hypothesis, and bring your column, okay? Then you come down and you write the alternate hypothesis, which is H sub A. Remember, I told you you can also write it H sub 1, okay? Then you bring your column. Then go back to the statement and check. It said the mean, okay, which is mu, is more than 16 hours. So see this word more than more than means greater than isn't it which is a statement of inequality so since it is a statement of inequality remember i told you that we assign all statement of inequality to the word to the alternate hypothesis which is h a or h1 so if that is the case then let's write this mathematically so we are going to have mu is greater than that is more than 16 hours so we write it mu is greater than 16 hours so after writing this then for the null hypothesis we just write the opposite of this so what is the opposite of greater than the opposite of greater than should be was less than or equal to so we write mu is less than or equal to 16 hours so you see that in question two the alternate hypothesis happens to be the claim so let's look at example three example three says a school publicizes that the proportion of its students who are involved in at least one extracurricular activity is 61%. So to write this, we write H0 and then put a column at the front of it. And then we write H sub A, okay, or H sub 1. You can write it 1. Okay, then you bring the column. Then go back to the statement. So this particular one says, the proportion it didn't say the mean and also it says is 61 percent okay so this is the word is 61 percent now take note of something in this question here you can see that you have at least please this at least word isn't referring to the 61 percent it's referring to um the number of extracurricular activity so it's a different way. Proportion is 61%. So the is is referring to the proportion itself. But this word here, at least, is not referring to the proportion. It's actually referring to the number of extracurricular activity. So be very careful with this kind of statement. So is 61%. So proportion is 61%. So is is a statement of equality, isn't it? So since it is a statement of equality, meaning we are going to assign it to the words H0. So we are going to have P equals 61%. So 61% 61 is 0.61. That is 61 divided by 100. So 0.61. So you see that here, I didn't use the symbol mu. I use P because we are referring to proportion, not mean. Okay. Then since you know the null hypothesis, we just write the opposite of this as the alternate. So for the alternate, we have P is not equal to 0.61. So in this particular one, the null hypothesis is a claim. So let's go to example four. Example four says, a university publicizes that the proportion of its students who graduate in four years exceeds 82%. So to do this too, we write the null hypothesis, which is H sub zero or H naught. Then you bring your column, then you write H sub A or H sub 1, okay? Then you bring the column. Now look at the statement again. It says the proportion, okay? And it says exceeds 82%. When we say exceed, exceed means it's greater than, okay? So greater than is a statement of what? Inequality. So since it is a statement of inequality, we assign it to the alternate hypothesis. So we are going to have what? P is greater than 0 0.82. 0 0.82 is 82%. 
exceed that is greater than then we write it opposite for the null hypothesis so we're going to have p less than or equal to 0 0.82 so in this one to the claim is the h sub a or h sub one so let's look at example five example five says a cereal company advertises that the average weight of the content of its 20 on size cereal boxes is less than 20 ounces to do this to first we write each lot and then we bring the column and then come down and then write h sub a and then bring your column okay now this one says the average when we say average average is the same as saying mean okay so average is the same as what mean and it also says is less than 20 ounces so less than is a statement of inequality isn't it so since it is a statement of inequality we assign it to the word to the alternate hypothesis so we are going to have mu is less than 20. so after doing this then what is the opposite of this the opposite is greater than or equal to isn't it so we write mu is greater than or equal to 20. remember average is the same as mean okay so we still use the symbol mu for it now the second thing we want to look at is how to determine the type of test it is now we have two type of test one tailed test and two tailed test now one tailed test has two divisions one is known as right tailed test and the second one is known as left tailed test but whether it is a right tailed test or left tailed test they are both called one tailed test now another name for one tailed test is directional test okay the another name for two tailed test is non directional test okay now how do we identify whether a particular test is a one tailed test or a two tailed test now to identify whether a particular test is a one tailed test or a two tailed test this is what we do kindly pay attention now irrespective of whether the null or the alternate is a claim that doesn't matter okay you always come to the alternate hypothesis now whenever you come to the alternate hypothesis you check the symbol over there now here you have a less than sign whenever you have a less than sign at the alternate it shows that it is a one-tailed test whenever you have a greater than sign also it also shows that it is a one-tailed test but whenever you have a not equal to sign is known as two tailed test also i told you that one tailed test has two divisions one is known as right tailed test and the other one is known as left tailed test since this is a one tailed test and this is also a one tailed test now let's be specific the one which is a less than sign is known as left tailed test the one which is a greater than sign is known as right tailed test so always check that properly okay so we can say now that example one is a what is a left tail test okay which is one type of one tailed test then example two is a right tail test which is one type of also a one tail test and then example three is a two tail test okay anytime you have a not equal to sign at the alternate it is a two tail test okay and then when we look at example four Example four has a greater than sign at the alternate. So it is a one tailed test. But to be specific, it is a right tailed test. Okay. Then when we look at example five, example five has a less than sign, which is also a one tailed test. But to be specific, it is a left tailed test. Okay. So let's go to the next subtopic, which is types of errors and how to identify them. Now, there's something important I want you to know, and that is no matter which hypothesis represents the claim, whether the null or the alternate hypothesis, or whether it is true or not, we always start hypothesis test by assuming that the equality condition in the null hypothesis is true. Okay, it means that we always assume that the null hypothesis is true. But at the end, after testing everything, then at the end, we are going to decide whether to reject the null hypothesis 
or you do not reject the null hypothesis. Now, since our decision is based on sample, there is a possibility of making what? A wrong decision. Okay. Now, let's look at this. Now, whenever you have a null hypothesis, which is H sub zero, if it happens that your null hypothesis is true, okay, and you do not reject the null hypothesis, then you've made a correct decision. It is true, so you do not reject it. So that's a correct decision. Okay. But if the null hypothesis is true, and then you reject it, then you've committed something we call type 1 error. Okay. And then if it happens that the null hypothesis is false, and you reject the null hypothesis, you've also made a correct decision. It's false, so you reject it. So it's also a correct decision. Okay. But if it happens that the null hypothesis is false and then you do not reject it, something which is false, instead of you to reject it, you do not reject it, then you've committed type 2 error. Okay. So if they ask you what is type 1 error, you say what? Type 1 error occurs when a true null hypothesis is what? Rejected. And then type 2 error occurs when a false null hypothesis is not rejected. Okay. Now, the probability of committing type 1 error is represented with alpha. Okay. So alpha is a probability of what? Committing type 1 error, which is also known as level of significance. And then we use beta for the probability of committing type 2 error. Okay. That's very important. Let's compare this to the legal system in the United States. Now, hypothesis testing is sometimes compared to the legal system used in the United States. Under this system, the following steps are used. One, a carefully worded accusation is written. Then two, the defendant is assumed innocent. Okay. Remember, when I was talking about the null and the alternate hypothesis, I told you that we always assume that the null hypothesis is true, meaning we assume that the null hypothesis is innocent. The later we decide to reject or fail to reject. So here too, we assume that the defendant is innocent. Okay. Until proven guilty. Until we prove the defendant guilty. So the, the defendant is the H naught. We are going to assume that he's innocent for a meantime. Okay. Until proven guilty. Okay. Now, let's take the defendant H naught. If it happens that the defendant is innocent, that is true, okay? And then the verdict is that it's not guilty, okay? Then that is justice, okay? Innocent and the verdict is that it's not guilty. But if it happens that H not is innocent and then the verdict is that it's guilty, then you've committed type 1 error. Now, if it happens that H not is guilty and you say it's not guilty, then you've committed type 2 error. But if H0 is guilty and you, the verdict is that it's actually guilty, then that is also justice. Okay, so you have to be very careful about that. So when you reject a true null hypothesis, it is type 1 error. But when you fail to reject a false null hypothesis, that is type 2 error. So let's take a question on this. A company specializing in parachute assemble states that its main parachute failure rate is not more than one percent you perform a hypothesis test to determine whether the company's claim is false so to solve this let's take question a first question a says state the null and alternate hypothesis a first write h naught and bring a column okay then write h sub one or h sub a and then bring a column now it says the failure rate is not more than not more than means less than or equal to okay not more than one means less than or equal to one okay so it's a statement of equality so since it is a statement of equality we are going to assign it to the h naught so when we assign it to the h naught we have what r is less than or equal to 0 0.01 1 divided by 100 will give you 0 0.01, okay? What is the opposite of less than or equal to? It is greater than. So we are going to have B greater than 0 0.01. I can also ask you that which type of test is it? Is it a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test? So to know whether it is one-tailed or two-tailed, remember I told you that you should always come and check 
where the alternate is. So you have a greater than sign here. So it is a one-tailed test. Okay. Now, but to be specific, which type of one-tailed test is it? It is a what a right tailed test since it is a greater than sign. Okay. H naught is a claim. Now, question B says, write a possible type 1 and type 2 errors. So, to write it, you can say, a type 1 error will occur if the parachute failure rate is actually not more than 1%, but H naught is rejected. Now, look at something. Since H naught happens to be the claim, okay, now H naught is saying that the parachute is not more than 1%, which is a claim. If it is true that it is actually not more than 1%, and you reject H0, then you've committed type 1 error. It, it means that H0 is telling the truth, but you've rejected it, so you've committed type 1 error. For type 2 error, a type 2 error will occur if the parachute failure rate is actually more than 1%, the H0 is not rejected. If you test and it happens that the parachute failure rate is more than 1%, meaning it is HA, if it happens that H A rather is true, and then you do not reject the claim which was H naught, then you've committed type two error. Okay. Then let's go to C. C says determine which error is more serious. Now, which error do you think is more serious over here? Now, let's analyze this properly. Now, let's say you commit type one error, which is that the parachute rate is not more than one percent. Okay, but you reject that claim. You rejecting it means that you are trying to tell the public that it is more than 1%, which is an error you've committed. Now, since the public are now thinking that it is more than 1%, it means that it's going to spoil the sale revenue of parachute sellers, meaning people will not purchase it anymore. That is one problem. So this is going to affect the suppliers. Now, let's look at this. Now, let's assume you commit type 2 error. And type 2 error is saying that the thing is actually more than 1%, but you accept H0, which says it's no more than. It means that you've exposed people to, uh, to death risk. So death risk is more serious than sales risk. Killing people with your type 2 error is more serious than what? Just losing sales. Okay. Then we can say that type 2 error is more serious in this case. Mostly, we statisticians avoid committing type 2 error by using the word do not reject. Now, when you look at that word, do not reject, you realize that it also means accept. But we don't like using the exact word accept. We like to use a synonym, do not reject, because we are trying to avoid anything that will lead us to type 2 error. So let's look at the next subtopic, which is the level of significance and the critical values. Now, when we talk about the level of significance, it is the maximum allowable probability of making a type 1 error. So, the maximum probability of committing type 1 error is known as what? The level of significance, which is alpha. So, you can have alpha of 5%, you can have alpha of 1%, you can have alpha of 10%, okay? That is the maximum probability of committing type 1 error. And also, when we talk about critical value, Critical value is a number that separates the critical region and the acceptance region. Now, let's say, for instance, you have this curve. Let's say the level of significance, that is the maximum allowable probability of committing type 1 error is given as, let's say, 5%. Okay. And also, let's say the test is a right tilt test. Then we are going to draw a right tilt here. Okay. This is right tilt. Then we assign the 5% to the right tail. 5% to the right tail. Okay. Now, the Z score that will be here is known as a critical value. But we are going to use the significance to find it by checking the table. And that will be referred to as a critical value. So let's look at how to find the critical values. So question one says, find a critical value, which is Z naught. Or you can write it Z sub C. To show that it's critical, you can also write it Z sub alpha. Okay, so find a critical value Z naught or Z sub alpha or Z sub C. Okay, for a left tail test at a 0 
one zero level of significance. Zero point one zero is the same as ten percent in percentages. Okay. To find a critical value, since this is a left tailed test, which is one tailed. Now, anytime you see left tailed or right tailed, you should know it is a one tailed test. Now, since this is a one tailed test, now depending on the table you are using, which I'm going to show you later. Okay. It's either you say one minus alpha or 0 0.5 minus alpha. So the alpha is 0 0.10 for a one tailed test. Okay. So one minus alpha. So one minus 0 0.10 give you 0 0.9000. And then 0 0.5 minus alpha, which is 0 0.5 minus 0 0.1, will give you 0 0.4000. Now you use one minus alpha if the Z table you are using is a full Z table. Then you use 0 0.5 minus alpha if the Z table you are using is a half Z table. So let me show you what a full Z table is and a half Z table is. Now this particular one at the left is a full Z table, okay. And then the one at the right here, the colored one here, is a what? It's a half Z table. How do you know the difference between a full Z table and a half Z table? For the full one, when you look at the first probability value, it is 0 0.5000, okay. But for this one, when you look at the first value, it is 0 0.0000. So that this is the half one and this is the full one. And if I will look at the drawing on each Z table, this one is shaded from Z to the entire left side. But this one is shaded from Z to the left only up to zero. So that shows that that's a, this is a half table and this is a full table also. This half table is mostly used by continuing students, especially those who are reading advanced statistics. Okay. But this full table is mostly used by uh, those who are new into statistics. Okay. So let's look at how to read this table. Now, for those of you using a full table, so we are going to check 0 0.9000 on the full table. So we look for 0 0.9000 at the middle here. Okay. So we are looking now for 90000. So when we look at this place, we have 0 0.8997. And then we have 0 0.9015. It means that 0 0.9000 is between this this but when you take a close look at this you realize that 0 0.9000 is more closer to 0 0.8997 than 0 0.9015 as you can see so since it is more closer to this particular one you can just take the z-score of 0 0.8997 as the z-score so let's check it so we have 1.28 this is 8 at the top here. So the answer is 1.28. But if you are using a half table, 0 0.5 minus 0 0.1 will give you 0 0.4000. So let's look for 0 0.4000 on the half table. So we have 0 0.3997 here. And then we have 0 0.4015 which is also between them. But 0 0.3997 is more closer. So when you take the z-score of 0 0.3997, let's check, it's also 1.28, 1.28, okay. So you see that we get the same answer. We get 1.28 here, 1.28 here. So whether you are using a half table or the full table, provided you follow what I told you, you are going to get the same answer okay so if you are using a half table use 0 0.5 minus alpha but if you are using a full table use 1 minus alpha okay Our answer is 1.2 but because this is a left tail test don't just write 1.28 you write negative 1.28 if it were a right tail test you leave it a positive answer positive 1.28 but because it is a left tail test you say the critical value of z is negative 1.28. Okay. So let's look at the next one. Question 2 says, find a critical value or values of z for a two-tailed test where alpha is equal to 0 0.10. Now, to solve this, when you look at the first one, which is a one-tailed test, I told you to take 1 minus alpha or 0 0.5 minus alpha for half table, isn't it? But because this is a two-tailed test, okay, 
you won't say 1 minus alpha. You say 1 minus alpha over 2. You divide the alpha by 2 before subtracting it from 1. For those using half table, you also divide alpha by 2 before you subtract it from 0 0.5. So we are going to have 1 minus 0 0.1 divided by 2. You divide the alpha, which is 0 0.1, by 2. Okay, and that will give you 0 0.05. So you subtract it from 1, and that will give you 0 0.9500. And then for those of you using the half table, you get 0 0.4500. So let's go and check on the table. So let's check for those of you using the, uh, the full table first. 0 0.9500. We are looking for 0 0.9500. So we have 0 0.9505 here. And then we have 0 0.9495 here. For these two, you can easily detect which of them is more closer to 0 0.9500. So for that matter, we take their Z scores, the two of them. We take their Z scores and then find the average. Okay. So what is the Z score of 0 0.9495? The Z score of 0 0.9495 is 1.64. And then the Z score of this is 1.65. So kindly take your calculator and check 1.64 plus 1.65 all divided by 2. You see that you get 1.645 isn't it yeah 1.645 in three decimal places okay then let's also check it for the half those of you using the half table now for the half table we are looking for 0 0.4500 isn't it so we have 0 0.4505 here and then we have 0 0.4495 here so it is between them so that will also give us 1.6 and then 1.65 so you see that we've got the same answer so 1.64 plus 1.65 all divided by 2 that's 1.645 in three decimal places so our critical value of z is what 1.645 but take note of something now because this is a two-tailed test okay because this is a two-tailed test you are going to write your answer as plus or minus 1.645. Now, what this means is that when you have a curve, it means that this has two tail, okay, tail one, tail two. So, two tail. And this is another tail. So, when we divided the alpha by two, we got 0 0.05 so it means that we give 0 0.05 to this part and then we also give 0 0.05 to this part and also the critical z scores we've gotten means that the positive 1.645 should be here and then the negative 1.645 should be here that's the meaning the, for the first one when we sketch a curve for it since it is a left tail test you only create a tail at the left side and then you give the entire 0 0.10 to the left. Then this negative 1.28 means this part here. So it means that if this were a right tail test, you would have shaded the right tail rather. And then the critical Z value would have been positive 1.28. Then let's look at question 3. Question 3 says, find a critical value of values. That is E0. For a two tail test, where alpha is equal to 0 0.05 and n, which is a sample size, is 8. Now, for this one, we are not going to use a z table. We are going to use a t table, okay? So we want to see how to find a critical value in t also. So to do this, we are not going to do the same thing we did in z, okay? How we read this one is different. Now, to read this one, the first thing we are going to do is to find the degrees of freedom. So the formula for degree of freedom in this topic is n minus 1. Okay. So to find degree of freedom, I'm going to have what? 8 minus 1, and that will give us 7. Now, after getting the degree of freedom, then you check. The question says two tailed test, isn't it? And it also says alpha is 0 0.05. So since alpha is 0 0.05, we go to the t table. Now, the question says what two tail test. Now when you look at the t table, we have one tail and then we have two tail. So you only check where two tail is for 0 0.05. So let's check 0 0.05. This is 0 0.05 here. 
0.05. And then this is degree of freedom. Now we got degree of freedom to be 7. So you check 7. This is 7. So you are going to check the value that corresponds to it. So 0.05 against degree of freedom of 7. You get 2.3. 365. So since it is a two tail test, then the value of t will be plus or minus 2.365. Meaning the left part, meaning the left hand will be negative 2.365, and then the right will be positive 2.365. Okay. Then let's look at question four. Find a critical value t naught for a left tailed test. Alpha equals 0 0.05 and n equals 8. To solve this also, first we find the degree of freedom. So the degree of freedom is going to be 8 minus 1, that is 7. And here too, our alpha is 0 0.05. But this says left tailed test. So a left tailed test is a one tailed test. Okay. So we go to the table. So we check where one tail is. So we check 0 0.05. So this is 0 0.05 at one tail. Then we check it against the degree of freedom of 7. And that will be 1.895. So the answer is 1.895. So since it is a left tailed test, then the t will be negative 1.895. If it were to be a right tailed test, you leave it positive. Okay, so positive 1.895. But this is a left tailed test. So you write negative 1.895. Now look at something. Question 3 and question 4 have the same sample size. And the same level of significance, but we didn't get the same t for them. The reason is that this is a two tail test and this is a what, one tail test. So be very careful about that. So let's look at the next subtopic, which is how to compute the test statistic. Now, to compute the test statistic for mean, that is when n is greater than or equal to 30, and the population standard deviation is known. I hope you remember that this is a symbol we use for the population standard deviation. It is a Greek letter called sigma. Okay. You are going to use this formula. Z is equal to X bar minus mu divided by sigma divided by square root of N. Okay. That is if N is greater than or equal to 30. And the population standard deviation is known. Also, if N is greater than or equal to 30. But... The population standard deviation is not known. It means that the sample standard deviation is known. You can still use the same z, okay, which says x bar minus mu divided by sigma over root n. You still use the same formula. Just that because you don't know the population standard deviation, you can replace the sample standard deviation with the population standard deviation. So this should tell you that Anytime the sample size is greater than or equal to 30, we always use the z for mean, okay? Also, if the sample size n is less than 30 and the population standard deviation is known, we still use that same formula. Z is equal to x bar minus mu divided by population standard deviation divided by root n. We still use that same formula, okay? But if n is less than 30 and the population standard deviation is not known, you are not going to use the z. You are going to use t. And the formula for t says that x bar minus mu divided by sample standard deviation s divided by root n. Okay. So this should tell you that whenever the population standard deviations are known, we always use z. Okay. And also, it should also tell you that whenever it is greater than or equal to 30, we always use Z. But it is not always when the sample size is less than 30 that we use Z. When the sample size is less than 30 and the population standard deviation is still known, we still use Z. The only condition that can make you use the T is when the population is normal or approximately normal. At the same time, the sample size is less than 30. At the same time, the population standard deviation is not known. That is, the sample standard deviation is known. So if you are able to meet those three conditions simultaneously, that is when we use the T. So they can ask you in exam, when do we use the word the T distribution? The T distribution is used when, one, the population 
is normal or approximately normal two the sample size is less than 30 and three the population standard deviation is not known okay i hope that's clear for proportion we use z also okay but in this particular one but since it is proportion since it's not for mean okay then the formula should be p hat that's a sample proportion minus p which is population proportion divided by square root of p times 1 minus p okay 1 minus p is also known as q divided by n please it is not p hat times 1 minus p hat be very careful about that it is p itself the population proportion not the sample proportion the sample proportion only occur once okay so p hat minus p divided by square root of p into bracket 1 minus p divided by n now for variance and standard deviation we are going to use chi square okay so the formula for chi square is n minus 1 into bracket multiplying s square s means sample standard deviation then you square it okay divided by sigma square sigma means population standard deviation then you square it remember that when you square a sample standard deviation it's also known as sample variance okay and also when you square a population standard deviation it's known as population variance so let's take some questions on this question one says find a standardized test statistic z for the following situation you have a claim which says that mu is greater than 15 and then x bar is 13.6 small s is 3.4 and n is 40. now even if the question doesn't tell you to find z you should be able to detect yourself that in this question i'm supposed to use z the reason is that the sample size is greater than 30. okay even though the population standard deviation is not known but since the sample size is greater than 30, we are going to use z. So what does the formula for z say? It says what? x bar minus mu divided by standard deviation over root n. But here lies the case that in this particular question, we don't know the population standard deviation. We only know the sample standard deviation. We are going to fix the sample standard deviation for this. So the sample mean is what? 13.6. So we substitute it there. So 13.6 minus the population mean is the one usually in the claim okay which is 15 so we substitute it there divided by standard deviation which is 3.5 over root n our n is 40 so root 40 you see that so when you put this on your calculator you get negative 2.53 so the standardized test statistic z for this particular situation is negative 2.53 okay please there's a difference between finding test statistic and also finding critical value when we were finding critical value we use alpha and then we go and use the table to find the z or t score so that one is a what is a critical value then when you are finding a test statistic for that one we use a formula so there's a difference between them question two given that h naught column mu is less than or equal to 20 h sub a is mu greater than 20 and x bar is 21.3 small s is equal to 2.1 n is equal to 16 find the standardized test statistic when you look at this particular question the question doesn't even tell you whether it is z or t so you need to detect that yourself so let's check it out now when you look at the sample size first the sample size is less than 30. For this one, you can't fully tell whether it is going to be T or Z unless we go and check the standard deviation also. Now, when we go and check the standard deviation, you see that the population standard deviation is not known. Rather, it is a sample standard deviation. So, since the population standard deviation is not known, at the same time, the sample size is less than 30. We are not going to use the Z. We are using a t okay so t is equal to x bar minus mu divided by please correct this it should be s not sigma okay so s over root n so let's substitute into the formula our x bar is what 21.3 and our mu should be what is in a claim okay so we're going to have 21.3 minus 20 
divided by a standard deviation is 2.1, isn't it? Divided by root n. Our n is 16. So root 16 is 4. So when you put this on your calculator, you are going to get positive 2.48. Okay. Now, take a look at something. Here, the sample mean was less than the mu. That's why we ended up getting a negative answer. Here, the sample mean is greater than the population mean. That's why we get a positive answer. Okay. So that's another thing you should keep in mind. Question 3 says, given that H0 is mu less than or equal to 20, H A is mu greater than 20, and X bar is equal to 21.3, and sigma is equal to 2.1, and n is equal to 16. Find the standardized test statistic. Now, when you look at this question two, this question is the same as question two, but the only difference is that this one gives you a sigma, but this one gives you a small letter s, whereas everything is the same. You have 16, 16, 2.1, 21 21.3, 20. Now, for this one also, when you look at it, you see that the sample size is less than 80. So you can't tell whether it is Z or T. But let's go to the standard deviation. Even though the sample size is less than 30, but when you look at the standard deviation, it is a population standard deviation. It means that in question three, the population standard deviation is known. So since the population standard deviation is known, we are not going to compute T in this case. We are computing Z. The first one, we use T because the sample size is less than 30 and simultaneously uh, the standard deviation is a sample standard deviation not a population standard deviation but this particular one even though the sample size is less than 30 since the population standard deviation is known we are going to use a z so z is x bar minus mu divided by population standard deviation over root n so let's substitute the values into it so we're going to have 21.3 minus 20 divided by 2.1 over root 16. That will give us the same answer, which is 2.48. But what you should know is that the first one should be T and the second one should be Z because of the conditions I stated. Okay. So let's take example four. Question four says, find the standardized test statistic Z for the following situation. Claim P is not equal to 0 0.23. X is equal to 53 and n is equal to 200. So here we are going to use z, isn't it? And the formula is p hat minus p divided by square root of p into bracket 1 minus p all divided by n. Please, all the formula I'm giving you in this video are for one sample test of hypothesis since I'm at the introductory part, okay? We have different formulas for two samples and then we will see that later. Okay, so we have p hat minus p divided by square root of p into bracket 1 minus p over n. You can also write it p times q over n. What you should know is that q is equal to 1 minus p. Okay. Then, now before we substitute, p has been given as 0 0.23. So we need to find p hat, okay. So p hat should be x divided by n, okay. So that should be 52 divided by 200. And that will give you 0 0.26. So our p hat is 0.26. So let's substitute into the formula. So we're going to have 0.26, which is the p hat, minus the p. That was a claim. So 0.23. That's the population proportion. It is a sample proportion. All divided by square root of population proportion, which is 0.23, into bracket 1 minus the population proportion divided by 200. So when you put this on your calculator, you get 1.01. .01. So the standardized z-score is 1.01. .01. Then let's look at question 5. Question 5 says, find the standardized test statistic chi-square for the following situation. Small letter s is equal to 4.47. And then the sample size n is equal to 20. So to solve this, we just use the chi-square formula, which says n minus 1 multiplying small letter s square divided by sigma square okay remember small letter s means sample standard deviation and sigma means population standard deviation so let's substitute into the formula when we substitute our sample size is 20 isn't it so let's put 20 so we have 20 minus 1 
Then our sample standard deviation is 4.47. So we substitute 4.47 in place of S then square it. Divided by the population standard deviation is 5.2. So we substitute it there. So 5.2 then we square. That will give us 14.0398. In case the question gives you population variance and sample variance, just substitute them straight without squaring them anymore. Because the question gave us population standard deviation and sample standard deviation, we substitute and square. Okay. So let's look at the next subtopic, which is how to find a p value. So, first, let's look at the meaning of p value. Now, p stands for probability. So, we say probability value. Now, p value is the probability that if the null hypothesis is true, of obtaining a sample statistic with a value as extreme or more extreme than the one determined from the sample data. So it depends on the nature of the test. Remember that when we wanted to find a critical value of Z or T, we use the level of significance, which is alpha, isn't it? Now, in the immediate previous subtopic, we look at how to find a test statistic. So what I want you to know here is that Anytime you want to find a p-value, you will need the test statistic to find a p-value. Okay, so we are going to be using the test statistic to find p-value. Just like how we use the level of significance to find a critical value. Okay, so let's take the test statistics we got in the immediate previous subtopic. Now, to find a p-value, now from question one, to find a p-value, since it is a z, we go to the z table. Now, when we come to the Z table, you forget about the negative on it, okay? Just come to the positive table and look for 2.53. So, we have 2.5 here and then 3. 0, 1, 2, 3. So, 2.53 corresponds to 0 0.9943. So, the p-value is going to be 1 minus the probability you get here. So, 1 minus 0 0.9943 will give you... 0.0057. So the p value for this first one is 0 0.0057. Okay. So let's go to question two. Question two, we got t to be 2.48. Now, to find a p value for t, you need to know the degree of freedom. You need to know whether it is one table or two tables. And also, so the computer t is 2.48, isn't it? And then the degree of freedom is 16 minus 1, that is 15. So we go to the t-table. Now when we come to the t-table, the degree of freedom is 15. So we come and check that first, 15. And also we are looking for 2.48. So on the line of the 15, we look for 2.48. So let's look for 2.48. Now we can see 2.48. But it is clear that 2.48 is between 2.131 and 2.602. Okay. So let's trace this upward to the one tail because it's a one tail test. When we trace it up, we have 0 0.025. And when you check this also upward, we have 0 0.01. So you say the p-value is between 0 0.025 and 0 0.01. So the p-value for question 2 is between 0 0.025 and 0 0.01. We are using a statistic software to give you the exact p-value for t. Okay. If you are using Excel, Excel tool will give you the exact p value. If you are using SPSS, Stata, and the likes, they will give you the exact one. Okay. But in T, we are finding it difficult to determine the exact value. So we should give a range that is between 0 0.025 and 0 0.01. Okay. So let's go to the next one. Question 3 says Z. So we are going to use the Z table 2.48. Okay. But it is a one tail test. Now, when we come to the table, we are looking for 2.48, isn't it? So we take 2.4, which is here, and then 8. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So we have 2.48 as 0 0.9934. So when you get the 0 0.9934, you subtract it from 1. When you subtract it from 1, you get 0 0.0066. Okay. So the p-value for question 3 is 0 0.0066. It is a one tail test, okay? The p value is 0 0.0066. If it were to be a two tail test, that 0 0.0066, you would have multiplied by two. 
but it is a one tail test, so the p value is 0 0.0066. So let's look at question four. Question four, the z score is 1.01, .01, and it is a two tail test, isn't it? The first, let's go and check 1.01. .01. So we go to the table 1.0. Then one zero one, so this is one point zero one, and that is zero point eight four three eight. So let's take one minus zero point eight four three eight. One minus zero point eight four three eight will give us zero point one five six two. Okay, zero point one five six two. Now, because this is a two-tailed test, it is not a one-tailed test. Because it is a two-tailed test, then that 0 0.1562 we've gotten, we need to multiply it by 2. So when we multiply it by 2, we get 0 0.3124. So the p-value for question 4 is 0 0.3124. Now for the question 5, I don't want to talk about it in this particular tutorial. We'll talk about it better in another tutorial. So now let's look at how to make decisions in hypothesis test. Remember that at the beginning of the tutorial, I told you that at the end of the day, we are going to decide whether to reject the null hypothesis or not to reject it, isn't it? Now, how do we then make that decision? There are two ways of making decision, okay? The first way is based on the critical value, okay? And the second one is based on the p-value. And some exam question will require you to use the critical value method. And then some exam questions also will require you to use the p-value method. So it is very important to know the two ways of making decisions. Very, very important. So I'm going to talk about the two of them. Okay. So the first one we are going to look at is how to make decision based on a critical value. Now, to make decision based on a critical value, what you are going to do is to compare the computed Z, that's a test statistic, okay, with the critical value of Z. Now, when you compare them, if the calculated Z is greater than the critical value of Z, the Z crit, okay, you are going to reject the null hypothesis. If the computer Z is less than the critical value of Z, you do not reject the null hypothesis. Or you say, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And the reason why I've used this line, this two line, which is known as absolute, there is a way I should have stated the rule for you for the negative separately and also for the positive separately. But in order not to confuse yourself, okay, ignore the negative signs and use the positive for your interpretation, okay? That's why I added the sign absolute. So if the absolute computer Z is greater than the absolute critical value of Z, then you reject the null hypothesis. When we say absolute value, it means that let's say negative 5, the absolute value of negative 5 is positive 5. It means that I'm trying to tell you to ignore the negative sign, okay? And then use the positive for interpretation and then whenever you want to make decision based on p-value also you are going to compare the p-value and the alpha that is the level of significance so if the p-value is less than or equal to alpha you reject the null hypothesis okay if you check your p-value and your p-value is less than or equal to alpha the level of significance you are going to reject the null hypothesis they can ask you all this question in exams. They can even ask you in MCQs as well. Okay. So if p-value is less than or equal to the alpha, that's the level of significance, you reject the null hypothesis. But if p-value is greater than the level of significance, that is alpha, you fail to reject the null hypothesis, or you, you do not reject the null hypothesis. Remember, do not reject or fail to reject is the same as saying accept. Then we are trying to avoid the probability of committing type 2 error. That's why we statisticians do not use the word accept here. Even though that's a synonym, okay? We use the word fail to reject or we say do not reject. So be very careful about that. So this is the constitution. Keep it. You can take a screenshot of it or write everything down, okay? That's what we are going to be using. Then let's look at how to conclude in hypothesis testing, how to make conclusion. Okay. Whenever you want to make conclusion in hypothesis test, it is very important you know which of them is a claim between the null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. Okay. Now, if the null hypothesis happens to be the claim, if H0 is a claim, to make conclusion, this is how we conclude. 
if you make a decision to reject the null hypothesis, then you are going to conclude that there is enough evidence to reject the claim. Okay. But if the decision is not to reject the null hypothesis, then you conclude that there is not enough evidence to reject the claim. You can say there is no enough evidence, or you can say there is not enough evidence to reject the claim. For this, you can also say there is sufficient evidence to reject the claim. The synonym for enough is sufficient. Okay. And then here you can say there is not sufficient evidence to reject the claim. But if the alternate hypothesis happens to be the claim in your test, okay, not the null hypothesis, but the alternate H sub A or H sub 1, if it happens to be the claim, how you are going to conclude will be different from how you will conclude when H not is the claim. So to conclude in this one, here, if H sub A, that is the alternate hypothesis, is a claim, and you ended up rejecting the null hypothesis, you know, we make decision based on the null hypothesis. Do you remember that the null hypothesis is a defendant? The null hypothesis is the one we assume to be true. So we are making our decision based on the null hypothesis. Do you get it? So if H sub A happens to be the claim and we reject the null hypothesis. So we are going to conclude that there is enough evidence to support the claim. Since the claim is H A, so we are supporting it since we rejected H not. You need to conclude that there is enough evidence to support the claim. That's how you conclude. But if you do not reject H not, meaning you are accepting H not, and you are rejecting H A, so we conclude that there is not enough evidence to support the claim, which is H. Since there is not enough evidence to support it, that's why we do not reject H0. So they can ask you in exams to conclude. And in fact, they can ask you in MCQ that if H0 is a claim, that is, null hypothesis is a claim, and then you reject H0, what will be your conclusion? So your conclusion should be that there is enough evidence to reject the claim. But if H0 is a claim, and you do not reject H0, there is not enough evidence to reject the claim. That would be your conclusion. They can ask you that if H sub A is a claim or H sub 1 is a claim, and then you do not reject the null hypothesis, what would be your conclusion? Then they will give you possible answers. There is enough evidence to reject the claim. There is no enough evidence. There is enough evidence to support the claim. And there is no enough evidence to support the claim. They will give you all these four as a possible answers. Please. You are going to choose there is not enough evidence to support the claim. Okay. So take a screenshot of this or write them down in your book and then learn them very well. Okay. You need, it's important to know how to conclude. So I'll end it here for now. So in the next tutorials, we're going to look at how to solve questions for one sample test of hypothesis and two sample tests of hypothesis. Thank you.